regenerative medicine is great and it's got a lot of potential and it certainly has been given a lot of opportunity to express itself mm -hmm. over the last 10 years. But it's really just one subset of a lot of great things that are happening in medicine where early diagnosis is part of it, patient involvement is part of it, better imaging tools, better cell delivery tools, better monoclonal antibodies. All these are coming together to create a better application to healthcare than we've ever even thought of. Welcome to the Regenerative Warrior Podcast, Doctor's Edition. One of the fastest growing regenerative medicine and anti-aging podcasts in the world. Each and every Tuesday and Thursday, I talk to the top experts to show doctors how to market, manage, and magnify their practice to help more people and make more money. Each episode is short and to the point without wasting your time with pointless conversation. Learn the skills to be successful without traveling to seminars or paying for expensive consulting fees. Are you ready? Because I am. <laughs> I'm Dr. Ross Carter, and it's time to start the Regenerative Warrior Podcast now. Before we begin, I've created a group discount program for all of our listeners where you can get regenerative products and services for prices far below that which you could get on your own. For example, Warden's Jelly starting at $475 per cc or Exosome starting at $360 per cc. The more members in our group, the better prices we all get. So please join our group today so that we can all get the best prices for products and services. Go to drrosscarter.com and sign up or text me your name and email to this number, 561-962-1231. This is important, so save it in your phone right now. It's 561-962-1231. Hi, this is Dr. Ross Carter with the Regenerative Warrior Podcast. Today, my guest is Joseph Krieger from Boston BioLife. Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Ross. I appreciate having the opportunity. So tell us what we're going to talk about today, Joseph. Well, you know, Boston BioLife has been out in the market teaching translational medicine to healthcare providers and really trying to bridge the gap between technology, research, and clinical practice. And we've learned a lot of things about different technologies, and there's a current environmental shift going on with respect to the adoption of these products, these clinical applications, their efficacy, you know, the regulatory environment, and some of the technology challenges that have been coming along. And I thought it might be useful to try to give like a State of the Union, if you will, an update on some of those considerations because there's a lot of misinformation. And I'll be the first one to tell you that I don't know everything. I try to be a repository for the truth. We don't have a dog in this fight, if you will, although we want to see the science progress. Yes. And I think if you study the history of evolution, the history of medicine and looking where innovation has come from, it's always gone through this phase of ridicule and attack and acceptance, et cetera. You know, I keep going back 25 years to the birth of interventional pain management as we know it. Prior to that, it was a subspecialty of anesthesia. And there was less than a thousand doctors that were doing interventional pain back in 1992. I hate to date myself, but I was a young startup medical device professional and getting into the field all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, thinking everything was great. Yep. And I watched these anesthesiologists develop their practices and learning how to take care of patients, much to the chagrin of the orthopedic and neurosurgical community who were convinced that they weren't qualified. And they simply said, look, these people are showing up on our doorstep and we have to do something about it. So fast forward 25 years, you see this well-defined to a market. But I assure you that if you went back to the late, early 90s, middle 90s, it was chaos and it was confusion and there was a lot of finger pointing. But at the end of the day, what happened was the technologies prevailed and the patients got better. Yeah. And so we saw them to be an inevitable outcome in the efficacy of that. And I don't think this is much different, honestly. I think we're in a different time cycle. I think things happened literally 10 times faster than they did back then. So we used to run these cadaver courses and teach people how to do radio frequency ablation and RAX catheters and spinal cord stimulators and over whatever, 12 years and all the time, you know, that market evolved into groups like North American Neuromodulation Society, the ASIP organization, which has to have over 10,000 or close to 10,000, and then all the subchapters of ASIP around the country. And so interventional pain is now kind of moving into regenerative medicine. They've recently released a document or a book or a guidelines. It's, it's extensive. It's 75 pages. And really what it is, it's an extensive literature review of all the different papers that have been published in interventional pain management, you know, ligaments, tendons, facet, joints, discs, epidural space, et cetera, using different biologics. And it's ranked according to what they call evidence strength, right? So level one evidence, level two evidence. So those things that are placebo controlled and randomized and double blind to the level one, there's not a lot of that out there, certainly not for regenerative medicine, but they gave it about a three out of five, which wasn't bad. 
because it wasn't horrible. It wasn't no. And you know that the standards weren't applied that could be applied as far as patient selection and technology and technique, et cetera. If you were going to try to create a, some type of more sophisticated study group, and I think that's happening, certainly in the realm of interdisciplinary biologics, major teaching institutions like the Mayo Clinic are studying the role of bone marrow aspirate concentrate on, say, the facet joint. The literature seems to be fairly consistent with respect to ligaments and tendons responding well to the mm-hmm. PRP and PPP derivatives. So that's interesting and exciting because now we're starting to see what technologies can be applied to what problem. So we know that in the spine, for example, it's a three-joint complex. We've known this for years. The facet joints and the disc work together in concert to form a segment. And I like to say our L5S1 is like our hinge, right? We bend almost 50% of that. So that's where most of the clinical challenges are. So looking at fusions, looking at drugs, looking at the opioid epidemic, it's not hard to consider that there should be a better way. So interdisciplinary biologics and some of the new regenerative medicine technologies are starting to make inroads now that there's somewhat of a, an acceptance, if you will. And, you know, I, I need, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about perinatal biologics and their relative role because they're not necessarily accepted in an interarticular joint injection space, 351 versus 361 regulatory situation, I think, is still being ferreted out for those products. But I do think that bone marrow fat now, nano fat, bone marrow, blood, PRP, and PPP, things like IRAP and A2M are being considered. Cell counters are coming along to add quality control. People are looking at standards because you got to know what the steps are and you need to be at least well-versed in your products and you got to eliminate variables relative to procedure and process because that's the only way that you can be sure that given different patients and different technology applications that you'll actually get a good outcome, right? Because there's so many things that can throw your outcome in the trash, right? not the least of which, as I say, is the patient. So bringing this all back around, it falls under the realm of education, education, resource allocation, communication to the market from the industry through the scientists, I think is the only way forward for this industry because it's so fraught with misconception. And let's face it, not everybody does well and not everybody knows what they're doing. And there seems to be a lot of emphasis on ulterior motive, which I don't completely believe with. I don't think people do anything for money. I do think there are people that are not fully educated, that don't understand what they're doing or how it's perceived. We also have a massive patient population banging down the door. You just have to go into social media groups to see it. They're desperate. They're looking for anything. Drugs and surgery don't work. Not everybody gets better. This is a revolution and it needs to be managed a certain way. And people like you and I, I think, are either dumb enough or brave enough to go out there and at least say what we think because to try to bring minds together so that we can think through the process Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm being influenced by the elections in New Hampshire, but I feel like I'm talking like a politician. The truth of the matter is that the tools are around us. The market is looking for this. The technologies are showing and bearing promise. So now how do we work together? And that's basically what we're trying to do as a company. For four years, we ran 20 some odd courses in interventional pain, orthobiologic, aesthetics, health and wellness, integrative medicine, and teaching the science behind peptides, hormones, et cetera. And what we realize now is the market's so dynamic and there's so many moving parts and so many organizations. We're better suited actually kind of reaching out to different groups and supporting them so that they can have their constituents learn and have access to resources that you know help their meetings and help people understand. Well, yeah, education is the key here. We've definitely got to get more people understanding what it is because doctors all the time, if I ever talk about anything perinatal, it's like, show me the research. Or no, actually, it's there's no research. That's all I hear. There's no study. There's no studies. There's no research. Nothing's been proven at all. What do you say to people who say that? I tell them to go to the Perinatal Stem Cell Society meeting at Salt Lake City, Utah, March 3rd through 6th, and listen to the world's leading scientists from the top academic entities in the United States and around the world talk about their experience with perinatal biologics, the clinical applications, and the miracles that they perform every day. Now, granted, they're in academic centers, and a lot of times these birth products are literally fresh, but they're stopping diseases, reversing diseases, and saving lives right there. So to discredit them, I think, is wrong. Sorry for the interruption again. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allographs, exosomes, supplements, legal help, or how to create a million-dollar business card and dominate your area, we're here to help you. Just text your name and any question to 561-962-1231. Write that down. That's 561-962-1231. Or go to our website at drrosscarter.com to learn more. 
Don't forget about our current $475 Warden's Jelly Special. On with the show. I think to accept them as is wasn't right either. But I think that the companies, you know, this gets back to the, what's the role of industry. You know, the FDA is trying to regulate, I guess, how these companies prove safety and efficacy of their products. But I think that horse left the barn. I mean, these things have been being used for since far back. I see steady number calculations since 1987, over a million, if not more than that, patients that have had just say IV cord blood. Mm-hmm. So I think that the bar is not accurate. I think there needs to be standards around sterility, at least don't infect people. I don't think patients get better because I think they're the wrong patient. And I think there's more to learn about patient selection. I think that's one of the biggest educational gaps that affects that industry. You can't just give this stuff to everyone. There needs to be some studies. I think the studies that are being done are really more on, like I said, active research. But the Paradiddle Society meeting, and you can find all these meetings on our website, at bostonbiolife.com is a very interesting place for you to set your mind and to meet with people that actually don't have a clinic. And they're simply researching. And most of the major pharmaceutical companies are doing something along the lines with periodontal biologics. And if you just saw in the research, I'll try to find this reference for people, Cellularity just published a paper or got, a, I think, an RMAT or an IND for the ability to create uh, CRT, CART T, CART and K cells to kill solid tumors using a perinatal derivative. They took a placental progenitor cell and they reversed it back to embryonic and then they trained it to become a CART T producing cell, CART NK, natural killer cells, and it's gone and they trained it to go after the tumor. So that's a whole new evolution of disease management. I don't know if people know this, but cancer deaths are down uh, 29% over the last so many years. And it's because of personalized medicine and, and, and targeted therapies. And I think that regenerative medicine is just a branch of that. The scientific revolution in medicine is all around us. And I think we can learn from other groups. But, you know, paying attention to the research side, looking at groups like the World Stem Cell Summit, or paying attention to publications like uh, Bioinformant. These are areas where you can really see what's happening across the world, across the complete spectrum of medicine, and not necessarily get too tied up in your own world. Because every day doctors are treating patients and they don't necessarily have the luxury or the time to kind of zoom out and say, oh, here's what's happening in cancer. Here's what's happening in diabetes. Here's what's happening in cardiac, et cetera. Well, you know, we also have in community fighting and you have companies saying everybody else is a scam, but I'm not. And we've got everybody saying these things in fighting internally. And that doesn't help progress anything. And I'm not talking politically. <laughs> no, it's no, it's a big demand out there. And I think wherever there's demand, it's funny, you see the pricing for these products and, you know, I, it was I think $1,000 or between 1000 and $2,000 a, a buy, maybe two cc's of X number of numbers of millions of cells or particles or exosomes or pixie dust. And now the prices are really whatever the market will bear. And different markets have, you know, in aesthetics, you'll see it as cheap as 100 bucks. In orthobiologics, it's up closer to 2,000. Some people are combining biologics with clinical with surgery. The adipose-derived market and some of the bone marrow harvesting companies are creating kits that kind of help orthopedic surgeons have better healing. That's, that's a win-win, right? It's a good application for the product. It's tied into something. You're not going to eliminate surgery with this today. You can definitely make surgery you know, heal better. And I think that's an important part of this. Prevent the surgery if you can, but if you can't, have these as adjuvants, you know, prepare the bone marrow, the fiber matrices, and the adipose drive biologics are very good integrators for healing, I think, in open surgeries, both in orthopedic and dermatology. Yes, I totally agree. I think they should be at least added to pretty much every surgery so you can speed up the healing. Well, I th- I think that's what's happening kind of secretly, where in the interventional or the, the sole practitioner markets, we have chiropractors, ortho, sports medicine, pain, people treating. I think it's, um, you know, if they're looking to try to create an anti-inflammatory effect and then turn on a healing cascade. I just don't think it can be done in one sitting. And I think clinics that are offering concepts like longitudinal care plan and path where it's personalized precision health care, looking at genomics and metabolomics and proteomics, the individual patients, things like DEXA, looking at body composition analysis, looking at hormone levels, hormones, peptides, cell signaling. People talk about exosomes as this magic thing, but really what it is, it's the mechanism by which cells communicate and it's paracrine signaling. So without saying, you know, we support this company or that company, we simply say, here's how one cell talks to another. 
And I think the cell type matters because whatever that is in the micro vessel, the vesicle is influenced by where it came from. And I think this is why the science part of this has to be understood because you're never going to get past the point of symbiotic biodegnosome or something that's created by cultural expansion of a perineal biologic or something that's created by the cultural expansion of an adult tissue like bone marrow. And we've heard about exosomes being created from the platelets of cord blood. So the innovation is there. The creativity is there. And the people looking to create the science, what is the best mousetrap? What is going to win the science fair? Well, I think it's going to be a combination of all the experiences that come from it. That's why I don't think you should be trashing everything. Granted, there needs to be standards. There needs to be better patient selection. The patients need to be educated. Patients just can't demand that you do anything that they decide because they don't know. They'll be the first ones that are disappointed. And these are very um, expensive procedures in most cases. Exactly. So I think it comes down to common sense and awareness for everybody. But I think that, you know, overall, I would say for orthobiologics, biologics, intervention pain, the MSK applications, the market's thriving. Ultrasound guidance, there's many endoscopes now. We know that x-ray works and fluoro is prevalent in pain. So I think when you combine imaging modalities with different diagnostic techniques, you kind of get a better handle on how to make, say, bone marrow aspirate concentrate. There's a safe bet for an intraarticular application, PRP for a ligament. So the crossover, and this is why I think it's important, and this is what I was trying to say, is why we accept at least the basics, uh, premise the potential of some of these products you know, the American Academy of Tissue Banking and the American Academy of Blood Banking, these are industries, entities that try to provide standards and education. The tissue donation space, I think, is so huge that maybe the perinatal products don't necessarily get the attention they need. And I think that's where some of the cleanup needs to be done. One in three births is a planned surgical C-section. And that's why there's so many of these derivatives. And I think the placenta in its native form is worth $100,000. When you chop it up into all its pieces, you've got the membranes in and out, you've got the blood, you've got the warden's jelly, and you've got you know, the ability to lyophilize things and create. And what you have in there is cytokines, growth factors, extracellular matrices, and exosomes all kind of buried into the collagen fibers. And so when you reconstitute that, and because it's perinatal, you know, it's immunoprivileged or immuno evasive. So the mother doesn't attack the baby. So there's not like a reaction to that. So I think the ECM products are woefully underappreciated. I think after cellular matrices are a very powerful tool in cellular regeneration and cellular maintenance. I think they're super highways. I think they're blueprints. I think they're intelligent communicators to the tissue itself. No one's ever told me this. I just think it because I see stuff in clinical science, things like when you decellularize and recellularize an organ and they're doing this, you take like a heart and you decellularize it. And all you have left is the ghost, the extracellular matrix. And when you can repopulate that with the recipient cells, that ECM adopts those cells and lets that integrate. And it's amazing to think about that. We've seen in research extracellular matrices be used to regenerate tissue in humans. A finger. I mean, that's been well published in maybe in Scientific American and then some papers on it, but it got some press maybe 10 years ago. So anyway, I think that that's an area. If you look at the perineural network and patients that have like autism, their molecular constituency is unique to autistic patients. And with 700 and some odd deleterious point mutations, how do you know where the real effect is? I think the perineural network is an important research topic as well for not just autistic kids. But so again, now we're getting into protein proteomics. As Guy Scuderi says, proteomics will revolutionize medicine. He's the founder of the alpha-2 macroglobulin. He's creating a combinant for that. Protein engineering is very powerful. So the, I guess the idea is to try to say regenerative medicine is great and it's got a lot of potential. And it certainly has been given a lot of opportunity to express itself Mm -hmm. over the last 10 years. But it's really just one subset of a lot of great things that are happening in medicine where early diagnosis is part of it, patient involvement is part of it, better imaging tools, better cell delivery tools, better monoclonal antibodies. All these are coming together to create a better application to healthcare than we've ever even thought of. So it's important to think about the box, if you will, and look down to say, oh, here's what they're doing in cardiology for hypertension. Here's how they're trying to regrow myocardium for ischemic heart disease open blood vessels, revascularized tissue with angiogenic promoters. And so where the rubber hits the road is how do we use these technologies to make patients healthier, prevent diseases and prolong life? Anti-aging, right, is the buzzword that people have been hovering around for years. And now we have the tools and the mechanics to actually understand it and refine it. And I think that's what's exciting, not whether it exists or not, but whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. It's how do we optimize it for everyone. Get the right results. Well, standardization would be obviously something that needs to happen. 
So we know what to use for what condition and how to do it. Right. Those are some of our most popular topics. You know, what biologic for what clinical indication? I just went to the uh, Evolve conference and they had a panel discussion. That was 90% of the topics. When do I use bone marrow? When can I use cord blood? When can I use peri, you know, fat or something else? And so, and again, they'll say it depends, right? And this is where you take the guile of the physician and you combine it with the scientist. Once they can understand the basics, the cell signals and the scaffolds, and then they understand the technology, how do I get this stuff? Do I harvest fat? Do I spin blood? Do I do bone marrow? Do I do a bone marrow aspirin harvest, et cetera? So once they understand that, then they combine the two. But it has to be for the right patient. So the sports meds guys kind of have it easy because they have healthier patients. They have athletes. They heal quicker, generally younger. You know, the weekend warrior crew, the, our group, the people that think they can still go out there and do stuff like ride bikes and play football or play hockey, and they get these injuries, you know, they're a different candidate, heal as quickly. And then you have the cut potatoes, which are people that are unhealthy in general that uh, are harder to heal and don't necessarily comply. So, you know, again, it depends, but it's certainly got a lot of variables. Yeah, patient selection is, the, I would say, one of the most important things when you're doing these procedures, as well as patient expectations. Picking the right people and making yeah. sure that they have the right expectations of what we're trying to accomplish. And teaching the physicians how to do the patient selection. You know, what are the criteria that you need to pick a healthy patient? And then patient adherence, making sure the patient knows that they can't do certain things or they need to do certain things. And again, going back to that longitudinal care plan pathway, there's a lot of things you can do to mm-hmm. get people diet, exercise, weight loss, chemical maintenance, things like hormones and peptides. All of these work well. You know, if you look at the sexual wellness environment, and it's kind of interesting, it's almost like a tale of two cities. You have the non-regenerative medicine group who rely on diet, exercise, nutrition, things like shockwave therapy, et cetera, to restore blood flow, if you will, because it's all a blood flow issue at some level. And then you have the regenerative medicine people that do things like P-shot, V-shot, O-shot, and they integrate that also with things like shockwave, et cetera. But they'll also, now they're starting to pick up the diet, exercise, nutrition component, and it's a cross-pollination. But at the end of the day, that market, women's health, men's health, as well as some of the cosmetic applications in those areas are booming absolutely super high moment. And so again, I think the difference, especially in regenerative products and having a good outcome is picking the right patients and understanding which biologic. Because if you look at P-Shot, they do everything. They do PRP, they do fat, they do bone marrow, they do exosomes. They'll do any of the cell signaling derivatives that they can get their hands on. At least people have their preferences without much, I think, consideration of technique and who the patient is. I know that certain people say they do things a certain way. I have a hard time paying attention to those procedures, to be honest. But I think it just shows that there's patient demand and the technology shows promise. But I think, again, it also shows that it's integrative. So taking a page out of the natural health books, that's why, and going all the way back to the beginning of this conversation, who are the physicians that participate? You know, okay, the anesthesiologist was told he can't do it. Now look at that. So, I mean, are the naturopaths quarterbacks? You know, are the chiropractors the leaders? Because they're certainly able to run businesses on a large scale with multiple moving parts with low dollar volumes and to turn those patients through. And then all this is, is another iteration of that. You're just adding on other services that make healthier patients. Healthier patients have better outcomes. So however you do that, the idea is to prevent the more complicated outcome. So in regards to education of doctors, now you have a platform that helps with that, correct? Right? Yeah. So one of the things I said we were doing is, you know, again, having run all these courses and having reached out to the literally thousands of doctors, we've had over 120 technology providers, uh, over 50 faculty participating have run, I don't know how many, 30, 40, 50 different tracks of, you know, hands-on training, ultrasound and aesthetics and exosomes and joint injections and fat harvest, as well as all the didactic, which really kind of evolved into basic science through clinical application to outcomes. In our third and fourth year, we were publishing studies, you know, three-year study of 247 knees from one of our clinicians showing a 70% improvement in VAS or West recruit, you know, the different scores they use. And then you have activities of daily living and real-world evidence. That's the FDA's uh, anecdotal documentation. And I think you start to see how people are starting to believe in this. It works Sorry for the interruption again. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allographs, exosomes, supplements, legal help, or how to create a million-dollar business card and dominate your area, we're here to help you. 
Just text your name and any question to 561-962-1231. Write that down. That's 561-962-1231. Or go to our website at drrosscarter.com to learn more. Don't forget about our current $475 Warden's Jelly Special. On with the show. As we've done all this, we realize that keeping track of everything that we've created and having it available to people that are new to the market or they don't know the basic science. So we have an online academy. We have four different pillars of support. So one is an online academy where you can go and watch videos from all the prior Boston Biolife meetings, both didactic and hands-on. The videos are $47. We've got physician memberships, healthcare memberships that are part of that allow you to get videos as part of that. And we'll talk about that next. But the Boston Biolife Academy is a way for you to have access to content. We've put things in packages, like we have a pain series, an ecstatic series, a basic science of regenerative medicine, where I actually go through a seven part evaluation. It's three hours and 250 slides where I talk about cell signal scaffolds, paracon signaling, endocrinology, hematology, embryology, and how the different constituents work together. What commonality do all cells have? And then how does this thing get into PRP and bone marrow and fat and what a perinatal and what's the regulatory, what's the research, what are the outcomes, what compliance measures should you consider? So that's a good way. So, you know, if you hired a bunch of new office staff and they didn't know anything about this, it's a good way to have them go because they'll have heard the words and they'll hear the terminology and they can you know listen to it again. So we have this is good for sales reps. It's good for people getting into the field. It's good for anybody as a refresher. It kind of ties together everything. So if you were like trained on PRP and you know nothing about fat, because fat kind of came from cosmetics, more like aesthetics and you know, plastic surgery, where bone marrow and PRP came from orthopedics. So when the two worlds collide, those doctors have different awareness of those products. So the academy is a great place to get continuous learning. Then we have our online CME research publication. Tool. This is uh, 9,000 peer-reviewed journal articles and over 30 million papers, and it's both clinical science and biotechnology where you can basically search a topic so you can look at you know exosomes in humans, and you'll get papers that pull up. So it's really about giving people access to real-time publications on topics that they're interested in, PRP for ligaments, bone marrow for osteoarthritis, adipose drive biologics for facial reconstruction. So if there's papers published in clinical science or biotechnology, those papers will be available to you. And it has up to 20 CME credits. And again, we're making this part of a membership. So one of the things we're trying to do is to unite the healthcare community with the industry, with academia, so that we can have a virtual resource to different tools and research papers and education. So the third thing we're doing is we're facilitating industry access. So when I looked at the kind of the show schedule for 2020, I realized there were so many organizations. So you have new scientific organizations that are creating meetings, then you have new clinical organizations that are creating meetings, IO Foundation, AOM, World Academy of Pain Management, Ultrasonography, ASIP. They're all running heavy in the regenerative medicine space. Then you have companies that are running meetings for their own training. Then you have societies that are running meetings like stem cell physicians, Perinatal Biologics Society, again, AOM. So we decided rather than trying to put a meeting in the middle of all that, we would reach out to all these organizations and ask if we could support them. Can we promote your meetings? Can we highlight what's good? Uh, can we invite our vendors? Can we invite our Because we've done over 2,000 people that have come to our door. So what do they do next? We can keep coming because it does change. And if we keep running meetings, which we will in the second half of the year when the traffic dies down. But in the meantime, we think there's a lot of places you can go to learn ultrasound. You know, people call us and they're like, I want to learn ultrasound. You know, they don't want to wait three months. So there's places you can go. You can go to Don Buford's meeting. He teaches ultrasound. You can go to Scott Sarvis' meeting. He teaches ultrasound. There's private practitioners. Michael Meng will come to your clinic and teach you ultrasound. So we want to be the resource. You want to learn ultrasound? Great. We have access for you to learn ultrasound. If you want to learn bone marrow harvesting, we have places for that. So there's different, like AOM is going to focus on orthopedics and they're heavy focused on spine. So if you want to learn interdisciplinary biologics, you go there. If you want to learn interventional pain, you might go to ASA. If you want to learn MSK ultrasound, go to Wacken, the World Academy of Pain Management. So we decided to be more brokers, if you will. I used to say I was the match.com of life sciences, and now I think I'm the eHarmony. So the more that you want to know about a clinic and what they need, and how we apply that to who the best resource is. 
rather than them trying to, and they appreciate it. They're like, oh, thanks. We know which meetings would be good and which ones wouldn't be good for certain people, given their experience and their interest. So industry access or educational access is the third pillar of our support arm. And then the fourth is technology access. So we have a buyer's guide of people that have been working with us for close to five years now. People that we know are innovating, people that are coming up with new products. They have strong regulatory positions. They train their physicians well, and they have good educational support in the realm of their relative technology. So if, if it's an ultrasound machine, you know, do they provide training? What's their warranty like? Is it a good product? Does it have good visualization? Is it oriented for MSK? You know, and how do you take the guesswork and how to tell people what's the best imaging tool is for you? Companies that make bone marrow, companies that make adipose. So we have a buyer's guide, but we have access to these technologies. So if someone says, I'm looking for a company that does this, we want to be able to say, well, here's a handful that you can talk to because we trust them. And we know that you're not going to be unhappy or you're not going to be worried. So really all this boils down to is just a membership, a physician or a healthcare provider membership. We also have a directory where we list people that have been to our meetings or are part of our membership group because we know that they'll have access to training. Malpractice insurance providers like that people have been, you know, have access to training. So we're giving you access to educational resources on a scientific level, access to research and publications that are real-time and peer-reviewed journal articles, not just PubMed. PubMed's not peer-reviewed. People like PubMed's free. Yeah, great. A third of PubMed is wrong. And I think that this just gives you a more powerful way to drill into what you want to know. And we're going to be sharing those papers with our members. We're going to be having weekly, if not monthly, groups, kind of like the old Bible study group. We'll all get together on a Sunday night. And we'll look at 10 papers from the world of bone marrow. And now the SVT, the fat papers are starting to come out for, for ortho. So maybe we do a look at those papers. Have a few doctors on board. What do you think about this? Is this legitimate? What questions should we ask? You know, again, it's it's what they call continuous improvement, right? Rather than waiting for me to run a meeting every three months so you can come and kind of have your head blown off by a PhD talking about biochemistry of regenerative medicine, having continuous access to content that's relevant in real time, I think is this is the model we're trying to adopt and trying to reach out and support. And then the societies can train their people, the doctors, the technology providers can take care of their patients, their clinicians, and we'll try to be a support organization for all of them. So you can see all of this at bostonbiolife.com and you know, you'll have access to what we're trying to promote. We're, we're always open to ideas. Feel free to call Sarah and ask her questions. She loves them. The phone rings and people say, well, what meeting do I go to? Or I want to learn this. She's really the matchmaker because she's the one talking to all the societies, coordinating all the, you know, how many people are coming from our group. And then the more unified this field is, the better it'll be overall, in my opinion. Sounds good. Your website is bostonbiolife.com, right? Yep, there's bostonbiolife.com, and then the academy is bostonbiolifeacademy.com, and then the new research tool is medhubresearch.com. All of these links are found on each other's site. It's all a work in progress, but it's functionally there. You okay. can see the meetings we're supporting. We're always adding new content, we're on, and we're adding webinars. So that's correct to say the webinars. 30 or 40, they're non CME content. They're not commercial, but they're sophisticated commercially. They talk about science, technology, things that are innovative ideas. You know, a lot of times it's good to hear from inventors, developers, so you can see how they figured out what's the story behind, you know, how someone developed something or learned about it. And that's important. So we feature companies, personalities, people, subjects, topics from practice management, regulatory, and clinical science. It's a good way to figure out what we're all about, but also you get a lot of useful information, I think, that you can use in your practice. And then, you know, again, it's a gateway to using and taking advantage of all the other resources that we have. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Please subscribe to be notified of all new episodes and also like and share this to help us grow. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, to have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allographs, exosomes, supplements, legal help, or how to create a million-dollar business card to dominate your local area, we're here to help you. Just text your name and your question to 561-962-1231. Write that down. That's 561-962-1231. Or you can go to our website at drrosscarter.com. That's D-R-R-O-S-S-C-A-R-T-E-R.com to learn more. Until next time, this is Dr. Ross Carter signing off. Signing off.